Okay, everyone, I think we're going to get started. Um, so on behalf of UNC Ashraman School of Pharmacy um, Postdoctoral Fellowship Program, I would like to welcome everybody who's online and here with us um, at Car Hall. My name is Nan. I'm a first year clinical development and drug development fellow with UNC and PPD. Um, tonight, I also have some of my co-fellows representing each of the functional areas where we offer fellowships in, um, as well as our program director, Dr. Dupuy here. Um, so we'll open tonight's presentation with some introductory remarks, and then we're gonna go over the specific positions we offer in our fellowship program and the overall structure, as well as the uh, application process. And then we're going to conclude with a Q&A session with all our fellows. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Robert Dupuy, who's our program director for the fellowship program. Um, Dr. Joellen Rogers is our associate director, and she um, was doing the presentation on Tuesday. Thank you, Nan. Um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, kicking off our uh, recruitment season for 2018. So we appreciate everybody who's online with us and watching or listening. So thank you for being here. And I'm going to go a little bit over into, into uh, what our program is all about. And um, let's start with, um, first of all, the School of Pharmacy. This is the Eshelman, uh, UNC Eshelman School of Pharmacy, and uh, our focus really has been on, uh, like many schools of pharmacy, a pharmaceutical care practice, education and research, and certainly the research part works its way into and connects very well to what our fellowship program is all about. Uh, we are currently the number one school of pharmacy in the United States. Uh, for a few years, we've been at number two, so finally we made it to number one. So it's really a great time to be here. Lots of exciting things going on. The fellowship program has been around quite a while, not as long as the pharmacy school, but uh, for over 35 years, our first graduate of the program was in 1981. So we've been doing this quite a while and, and uh, we've had some uh, great experiences, great faculty, great industry partners, and great fellows along the way. Okay. Um, the industry-sponsored fellowships that we offer uh, include clinical research and drug development. And you can see um, on this slide that uh, that also lists the uh, our sponsors um, uh, who we work with very closely. Uh, we also have uh, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and pharmacometrics fellowship, regulatory affairs, medical affairs, and also pharmaceutical outcomes. We also have some um, academic fellowships, which have also uh, been around a long time, and those are primarily in the areas of heart failure, cardiovascular disease, HIV, infectious disease, oncology, and we're one of only, I believe, two schools in the, in the uh, schools of pharmacy in the country that offer a T32 clinical pharmacology program, which is sponsored by the NIH. I'm going to go through a few slides with some nice pictures of our wonderful fellows. And these slides include uh, our first year fellows as well as our second year fellows. Like you just heard a little bit from Nan, Nan Wong, who is uh, with PPD and, you, and uh, also it indicates where, what school they went to before they came to our fellowship. And you can see that, yes, we have several UNC graduates, but we also have many of our fellows who come from all over the United States. And uh, we also have some from other parts of the world uh, during our program. And you can see too that their contact information is on this slide um, as well. And so here are our clinical drug development fellows, and actually one of them, Kaki Buchtel, will come up and talk about the uh, drug development fellowship itself. We also have some regulatory affairs and health outcomes fellows, and Sarah Angioni is, is one who will be here tonight and talk about her experience and what the regulatory affairs fellowship is all about, as well as Daniel Grati, who is a health outcomes fellow as well. He'll uh, present some information also. Medical affairs is another area in which we have a fellowship program and tonight we have Prani uh, Paka who is in his second year who will dis discuss um, and present uh, some aspects of the medical affairs fellows. We also have several PKPD pharmacometrics fellows and uh, one thing I'll mention is that uh, one of our partners in this area is Quintiles 
And Quintiles actually has two locations, one in Research Triangle Park, which is in this area. It's just a little bit down the road from us, as well as a, a headquarters in Kansas City. And so one of the fellows we have tonight, Sharif Sharabi, uh, is uh, the fellow who will be going to uh, Kansas City. But it, uh, the other thing to mention is that the other companies um, besides Quintiles also ha are located in uh, what we refer to as RTP, or Research Triangle Park. So they're close by, although uh, Regulatory Affairs Fellows actually will spend some time here in the university and then go out to Philadelphia uh, with GSK. Then we also have uh, several academic fellows, and Lauren Price is here, and she's going to talk a little bit about the Hematology Oncology Academic Fellowship as well. So just to give you a little bit of overview that about the training program, it is a two-year training program, and typically the first year is spent here at UNC working with faculty, and fellows um, don't necessarily get to choose faculty, but they have some input on who they might work with in terms of uh, you know, doing research in a particular area. And basically, the, the emphasis of this program is really to get some hands-on experience with clinical uh, studies. And so understanding what goes into it, managing those studies, doing analysis, and, and things like that are what this program's all about. So it really is a great experience. You get down at the, at the ground level to see what goes on in conducting clinical research. We also offer coursework, and in another slide, there's a list of some of the courses that we offer. Some of these are required, depending on what kind of fellowship you're doing, and others are offered sort of as lib or as sort of as an elective, depending on what your interest might be as a fellow. We also have a weekly graduate student and fellow pro, uh, seminar, which all our fellows participate in and attend, and so that's really a division seminar, so there's lots of folks presenting information and data that you might otherwise not be um, privy to. Also, we have a monthly fellows forum, so where we, where we meet once a month, since it is monthly, and we bring in folks from the industry within the area with re from Research Triangle Park, not just from our partner companies, but also uh, some of our other companies who aren't necessarily our partners who come in and talk about different aspects of drug development, and there's a wide range of topics. And it's also an opportunity for our fellows to meet new people, people who are in industry, and also uh, um, develop some networking as well with those individuals. We also have various, numerous uh, workshops, seminars in this area that fellows can attend and participate in that enhances their education and training while they're here, and also they have the opportunity for those of, of the fellows who might be interested in a little bit of teaching or presentation, developing presentation skills, we have a mentoring program, a teaching mentoring program that our fellows can participate in. And then the second year, primarily they spend at the company uh, focused on company work or industry work. Uh, one thing I'll mention is that during the first year, even though the primary responsibilities are working with faculty here, they actually will work on some small projects that are related uh, to the company that they, they are doing the fellowship with. So you'll hear a little bit more about that. Okay. The coursework, as I said, is so for some fellows it's required, and for other fellows they tend to be more of like an elective, depending on their interest, and the coursework usually involves things like clinical study design, PKPD, uh, some metrics, uh, regulatory affairs certification. So even if you're a drug development fellow, you might decide you want to take the regulatory affairs certification course, which is offered down the road at Duke. Uh, we have other courses, too, in genomics, leadership, and, and as I mentioned earlier, public speaking. Um, as I mentioned, we have the Met Fellows Forum, which is a great way to meet other people in industry and network as well. One other opportunity that we do offer our fellows, not all our fellows do this, um, part of, partially because it depends on how many spaces are available for the FDA to take our fellows, primarily in the Office of Clinical Pharmacology. So we've had some fellows, one to two, maybe three, sometimes four in a year, who might go up to the FDA and do a rotation up there. And that rotation is usually a two to three month rotation working in the Office of Clinical Pharmacology. So, so that can be another uh, great experience during the fellowship program. So as I mentioned, we, we have several different academic fellowships. So I will turn it over to Lauren Price, who is our Hematology Oncology Fellow. Lauren? Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Ripui. 
Um, so like Dr. Dupuy mentioned, I'm a second year academic fellow uh, and my area of interest is oncology. Uh, so I work with Dr. Zamboni here at UNC. Um, one of the things that's a little bit different about the academic fellowships is that the entire two year uh, curriculum is here at UNC. We don't have a partner, uh, industry partner that we go to. And so we spend the whole two years here um, with your particular mentor. Um, there's a lot of different collaborations that go on. Um, I know I work with Dr. Zamboni and we have some uh, collaborations in uh, gynecology, oncology up at the university um, hospital. And our other fellow that I know right now, our academic fellow in heart failure works a lot with the heart failure clinics as well as some phase three clinical trials. Um, but there's a lot of different collaborations. And one of the things you'll probably hear a lot about this fellowship is that um, the fellowship is what you make of it. Uh, so you can go a lot of different directions depending on what your areas of interest are. Um, for me in particular, right now I'm mostly working on preclinical studies. Uh, the previous academic fellow from me uh, more, worked more on clinical studies, um, but I do have some clinical experience getting to consent patients. Um, but for my work, I mostly work on preclinical studies. Um, there are a variety of other options. You can work on grant funding. This year I wrote a grant that was funded by uh, a pilot grant through CCCNE. Um, you can work as a study coordinator. That's what our uh, heart failure academic fellow I know does a lot of right now, working on uh, heart failure clinical trials. Um, we also have the opportunity to present our findings. Um, I've presented four different posters at conferences in the last year, um, working on review articles and a textbook chapter. So there are a variety of options for the academic fellows. Um, there are three different uh, areas of interest right now. Uh, not every year do we actually uh, recruit for all of them. So if you have a particular interest in one uh, therapeutic area, definitely wanna reach out and determine whether or not uh, this year there would be an availability. Um, one of the things that Dr. Dupuy mentioned earlier is that if you do have an interest, there are some opportunities to teach in the School of Pharmacy. Uh, so either lecturing in individual coursework or helping with the small group discussions that happen in the School of Pharmacy. Um, I have not uh, experienced this, but I know our other fellow has done more teaching than I have. Uh, clinical opportunities, there's also options to work in uh, individual clinics. Uh, like I mentioned, our other academic fellow right now works in the heart failure clinic sometimes. Uh, and then many, many opportunities to present and uh, give your uh, data out to the world. Um, so the academic fellowships have a lot of uh, opportunities. Like I said, it's what you make of it. So the more opportunities you say yes to and get to collaborate with the great workers here at UNC, you can take a lot of advantage of a lot of those opportunities. Uh, so I'm gonna introduce our next speaker who's one of our clinical development fellows here, Kaki. Thank you. So as Lauren mentioned, I'm a first year clinical research and drug development fellow, and I'm with United Therapeutics. Um, so the clinical research and drug development, as well as the medical affairs, are very similar. They're the same for the first year. They differ in their second year. Um, but for the first year, you spend the year, the academic year, on campus, and the majority of your time will be spent doing research, whether that's clinical or preclinical. You kind of have opportunities to work in all different phases um, based on which mentor you're paired with. Um, you also have a little, a small bit of your time spent doing didactic coursework, such as the clinical trial design class that Dr. Dupuy mentioned. And then a small portion of your time might be spent with patient care or teaching. Again, that's kind of dependent on what the fellow wants as well as what the mentor has to offer. Um, so also during this year, you might have the opportunity to write a protocol. Um, it's pretty cool because you can, you know, even write it from scratch all the way through, which is neat. You also might have some experience with the regulatory affairs, and you um, could work with the IRB, sit in on one of those meetings, as well as um, getting that IRB together for your own study that you might be working on with your mentor. You also have a lot of data analysis that you can be involved in, as well as study coordination. Um, this year, I'm coordinating a couple studies for industry-sponsored trials, which are really neat because I'm able to see a bunch of different companies and how they uh, run a clinical trial. You also have plenty of opportunity for presentations, writing abstracts, and posters. So in terms of the second year for the clinical research and drug development, this would be spent either at United Therapeutics or PPD. And you'd have the opportunity to be a real um, 
a real member of the clinical team. You'd have um, the ability to work in both clinical science as well as clinical operations. I think that's something that's um, really important between United Therapeutics and both PPD is that they offer the ability to do both of those things. Um, you can also work on protocol development and you kind of take what you learn in that first year on how, what does it look like on the academic perspective and how can you apply that to your second year at the company. You're, you're going to have a ton of project management, um, working with the regular regulatory affairs team, as well as the preclinical team. Um, you can also have a lot of global uh, strategic development and feasibility. So when you're thinking about which clinical sites you want to run your trial, um, you want to think about which ones make the most sense uh, in terms of feasibility. And you can actually go and uh, meet with some of those sites and help them set up these sites so that they can start recruiting patients. And then you'd be monitoring them throughout the trial. Um, some, one of the questions we had ahead of time was um, whether or not rotations were available. And that's dependent based on what you and your preceptor decide if you want to have rotations in different aspects of the company, specifically PPD offers that. You're able to take advantage of that. Um, but if you'd want to stay in a specific area longer, you can also do that as well. So now I will turn it over to Prani. He's a second year medical affairs fellow who will tell us a little bit more about medical affairs. Thank you. Um, my name is Prani. Uh, as Kaki mentioned, I'm a second year medical affairs fellow. Um, I just want to give a little bit of context. Medical affairs is a very broad term. It incorporates many different components, um, and it varies within the definition in itself can vary between companies. So I'm just kind of going to give a broad overview for today. Uh, so the first thing is clinical proficiency within the assigned therapeutic area. So sometimes you do have an option to choose on which therapeutic area you want to work in. Uh, other times they'll assign you a therapeutic area. So it really depends on what the need is for the company at the time. Uh, collaboration across cross-functional teams to support the overall medical strategy. This is one of the key roles for medical affairs where you're, collabor you're, you're serving as a bridge between clinical development and commercial. So they're really depending on you to translate the clinical data into medical deliverables that uh, commercial colleagues or even other medical colleagues can use to uh, educate, um, provide information or rare, uh, raise awareness for uh, certain medical uh, uh, aspects. And the next one's launch preparations for new medications and our new indications or label extensions. So this is really dependent on what's going on with the company that you're going to. Uh, sometimes you do have opportunities to work on uh, launch prep teams. Uh, this is a very valuable experience because you get to see many things that um, need to uh, be aligned and uh, take place in order for uh, proper FDA approval to take place. And uh, uh, currently I have some experience in uh, uh, as I serve on a launch team for a new label extension for one of the drugs that um, uh, GSK is looking to get um, a new indication for. It's a very valuable experience. Competitive intelligence and market analysis, this is where you work closely with commercial colleagues. So commercial colleagues are really looking for the medical affairs folks to uh, give them a little bit of background on what the competitor landscape looks like. And they also are looking for medical insight on what they can use uh, to leverage when they're going out to speak, when they go out to speak with external customers such as payers. Medical review of promotional materials and medical content development. So these are uh, two different things, actually. So medical review of promotional materials is extremely important. Uh, this is one of the key roles for medical affairs is everything that commercial colleagues or other colleagues are using to promote a product or promote a disease state, it has to be reviewed by medical teams to ensure accuracy. And we also have proper clinical evidence to back up that claim. Uh, also, you'll be uh, certainly involved in medical content development that uh, that will be used to educate internal and field-based colleagues such as met, um, MSLs. Interactions with external experts to provide medical support for Congress meetings. This is also a very key role for uh, medical affairs. So I know a lot of you might be interested in MSL type of roles. So this is what your role is going to be, interacting with the external experts to not only establish the uh, relationships, but also maintain um, relationships with those experts. Because experts are key to anything you want to do, either education or uh, raise disease awareness, or even if you want to run clinical trials in the future, you need to have those relationships with those experts. Understanding of laws, regulation, policies. Uh, once again, this is very important. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, regulatory uh, ins oversight over pharmaceutical industries. So it's important for all medical affairs um, uh, personnel to be educated on the laws, regulation, and policies that uh, FDA or other regu regulatory bodies um, 
uh, impose on pharmaceutical industry so that we have an idea on how to interact with the healthcare professionals. Finally, you do work uh, closely with your regulatory colleagues as well to not only prepare uh, NDA annual reports, but also to assist with providing label updates. Uh, with that, I'm going to be turning it over to Sarah and Gion, who's going to go more in depth about regulatory affairs. Thank you so much, uh, Prani, for the introduction. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Sarah Angioni, and I'm one of the two Global Regulatory Affairs Fellows with UNC, as well as with GSK, or GlaxoSmithKline. Um, just a little bit about Global Regulatory Affairs. Essentially, Regulatory Affairs Individual is a central hub um, working with the regulatory agencies such as the FDA within the United States, as well as the EMA in Europe. Um, and working with your colleagues uh, within the company um, and ultimately collaborating with those within clinical development, statistics, sta safety, um, non-clin toxicology, et cetera, in order to facilitate um, essentially NDA submission, uh, IND, or other labeling uh, updates. All right, so in terms of the program structure, the first six months is spent at UNC and GSK that is um, located in Research Triangle Park and UNC in Chapel Hill. Essentially, half the week is split up, so approximately two days out of the week is spent at UNC, whereas the remaining portion of the week is spent at uh, GlaxoSmithKline. Now, the first portion of the week, um, like I mentioned, at UNC is focused more in a clinical setting. You're working with the Institute for Global Health and Infectious Disease Office uh, within Regulatory Affairs, as well as the UNC Lineberger Center, which is the cancer center here at UNC. Um, ultimately, here you're enabled to gain a lot of clinical knowledge, which will help you down the road because, like I mentioned before, there's a lot of interaction um, with clinical development and regulatory affairs. Um, you'll also have the opportunity to do coursework, um, so this will aid in more of a didactic setting. You'll have the ability to take a um, RIC course, which is the Regulatory Affairs Certificate, and prepare yourself to take the RAC exam, which is highly sought after um, in regulatory affairs, um, as well as right now I'm also participating in a study design course. Um, on Wednesday evenings as well, which um, also aids in um, your ability to continue in an academic setting. Um, just shifting gears. Um, so the last year and a half or 18 months is full time at uh, GlaxoSmithKline, located in Collegeville, or other known as Upper Providence in Pennsylvania. So the relocation is um, reimbursable, and the preceptors and mentors really help you um, enable you to uh, prepare for the transition between um, living in North Carolina and shifting gears into Pennsylvania. Um, so while full-time at GSK, you'll have the opportunity to engage um, in a variety of regulatory projects, um, whether that be in labeling, advertising promotion, um, more so in the therapeutic groups, you know, it could be in um, oncology or within HIV. Um, as well as you'll still have the ability to continue um, in a didactic setting, more um, working remote. Um, some of the fellows in the past have participated in a leadership course that was offered as well. All right, so I'm going to switch gears and hand it over to my co-fellow, uh, Sharif. Thank you. Thank you, Sara. Um... Hi everyone, my name is uh, Sharif, I'm a Quintile's first year uh, PKPD fellow and I'm happy uh, to be here today with my co-fellows to give a brief overview of um, the PKPD uh, fellowships um, offered at UNC School of Pharmacy. So for the PKPD uh, pharmacometrics uh, fellowships, the main objective is to provide expertise in drug development, uh, quantitative pharmacology, uh, translational research and pharmacometrics. Um, very few um, basic textbook um, definitions, just to make sure that we are all on the same page. So pharmacokinetics mainly refer to uh, studying the effect of the body on the drug, 
absorption, distribution, metabolism, and uh, elimination. Uh, pharmacodynamics refer to the effect actually of the drug on the body. And on the other hand, pharmacometrics mainly refer to uh, the use of modeling and simulation tools and programs uh, to quantify um, um, drugs and uh, disease states. So the big question is why do we do uh, PKPD studies or why these studies are important? Um, the main objective of most of the PKPD studies is to provide uh, some sort of uh, dosing guidance. Um, this dosing guidance can be for a, a new medication under development uh, or uh, for a medication that has been, um, been in the market for years, um, but we are looking for the dosing for a special population uh, like pediatrics, patients with renal failure, um, oncology patients, et cetera. And as you may uh, be aware, uh, there is actually a recent trend in the industry now uh, and in drug development for a smarter uh, trial designs um, to make the clinical trials more efficient, decrease the costs, and at the same time increase the knowledge available uh, for both the developers, the pharmaceutical companies, and uh, for the regulators as well, uh, mainly the FDA. Uh, as far for the structure of the fellowships, so for the first year, uh, all fellows spend uh, the first year uh, at UNC. Um, they receive training in designing and implementing PK and PD studies in healthy volunteers or special populations um, or relevant in vitro preclinical models. They all receive training in performing uh, non-compartmental and compartmental analysis. Um, and there are opportunities also for uh, training uh, on laboratory methods to evaluate clinical disposition uh, problems and um, perform biostatistical analysis and pharmacometrics as well. For the second year, uh, each fellow spent uh, the year at the sponsor site and um, the fellows start to apply what they have learned in the first year uh, in real uh, projects. Uh, really depending on uh, the projects available at the sponsor site. Uh, so if you are in uh, Quintiles, Kansas City, uh, most probably you'll be involved in projects uh, like traditional PKPD analysis projects versus if you are in Quintiles RTP site, most probably you will be involved in uh, pharmacometrics projects uh, that focus on, again, uh, drug modeling or uh, disease state modeling. With this, I finish, and I will hand over uh, to Dan. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining in on the webinar. Uh, so just to give you a very brief overview for uh, what health economics and outcomes research is, um, everything has a very big push towards value-based uh, research, value-based practice, and uh, outcomes research is really kind of at the forefront of generating those values, that evidence to show uh, what's working actually out in a patient population, whether that's a drug or a clinic. Um, those kind of metrics. If you've done the p and uh, competition through AMCP, uh, you may have noticed on the, on the dossier they have the economic modeling. So a lot of outcomes research is working on that economic modeling as well. So this is a two-year fellowship. The first year is going to be right here at UNC. Uh, I'm here about three to four days a week. One to two days a week, I'm at GSK, also in, also in North Carolina. So you are here in North Carolina for two years. Uh, during my first year, I'm really working with the faculty and staff here. Uh, they've done a fantastic job in terms of um, either helping me pursue independent projects or they're very, very uh, open to letting me jump on to projects they have going on through the outcomes department as well. You're very encouraged to take uh, courses here through the College of Public Health, and that's really kind of up to your learning plan to let you know whether you need to work on research methodology, maybe biostats, uh, epidemiology, or even policy. It's very tailored to you and to see uh, where you need to work on your strengths um, to kind of help you with a successful outcomes career. So during those one to two days a week at GSK, and then more so during the second year, there you're working with the value uh, evidence outcomes department over at GSK, working on those uh, economic modelings that I'm talking about and really kind of supporting the team on all of the GSK products across the uh, US market. Um, 
a lot of great advantages to this. I've really enjoyed my time here. Uh, really sets you up for a great position, whether you want to stay in industry and stay in that health outcomes liaison role or a health outcome scientist. If you want to go into managed care, this is a great uh, place to get your training done. And then also keeps the door open if you want to stay in academia as well. So with that being said, I'll turn it back over so we can talk, so we can finish up a little bit more details about the, uh, the program in general. Thank you. So just a few things to, to mention is that we do offer a competitive stipend that, that our salaries are uh, in the high 40s according to NIH guidelines. So I think we do pretty well from that standpoint. We also uh, provide some relocation expenses. Um, so several of our fellows come from out of state and certainly there's some cost involved with that. So we do help them with uh, relocation. We provide health insurance and we also have a benefits package in terms of um, um, travel, professional development, and those sorts of things. We obviously provide space for the fellows, a chair, a desk, a computer, and those kinds of things. Uh, we do also provide support, financial support, for some professional travel to meetings, as well as career development. So, um, you know, if you're interested in going um, or doing some things that will help with, with that, we will also provide that. Oops, sorry, wrong button. Okay. So as far as recruitment and the application process, uh, we will uh, open the application uh, portal um, October 15th, which is um, in a week or so. And so you can apply online. We also are, will be at ASHP at PPS, Personal Placement Service. And so you can also go through them and we will um, uh, also work through the PPS to set up interviews. And typically, <clears throat> depending on what you're inter interested in, in uh, what pursuing a certain fellowship determines who you're going to interview with. So in other words, if you're interviewing with drug development, you would interview not with just PPD, but also with United Therapeutics. If you're interviewing or interested in medical affairs, we'd have you interview with uh, GSK as well as United Therapeutics and, and so on. Um, and so it sort of depends on the program. But, but you'd have several interviews with faculty and our industry sponsors. We actually will have our industry sponsors there doing interviews as well um, during that time in December. Uh, we will be at ACCP uh, within the next week or so, too, in case any of you are at ACCP and want to talk with us about our program further. Um, as I said, the application portal opens October 15th, and we do have a, a couple of deadlines. One we, we, can, we call early consideration, which is November 15th, and, and it just gives us um, an opportunity to get a better handle on the applicants uh, ahead of time before we probably will meet them at mid-year. Uh, and so we also have a final application date of January 1st, which would be 2018. Now that application process would involve submitting a CV, a letter of interest, three letters of reference. At this point early on, we would ask you to provide an unofficial transcript as well. And obviously if we do decide to uh, make you an offer, then of course we would need an official transcript to prove that you graduated from the school of one sort or another. Um, the other thing is that for us, the main place to meet people is at PPS, and then after that, we actually rank candidates in terms of who we want to bring in on site. So then we determine that, and then when we bring candidates on site, we typically bring them in early J January, um, probably through February, but hopefully, you know, we fill our positions by then, so which we usually do. So uh, again, hopefully that will uh, all work well. So again, there's, there's plenty of opportunities and plenty of partners that we, that we work with. Uh, certainly the main ones are GSK, United Therapeutics, um, um, PPD, and Quintiles. So, um, and of course we have a, a, a number of academic fellowships too that you might be interested in. Okay. So we do um, have opportunities for our fellows to uh, socialize. And uh, every group's a little bit different from year to year, but as you can see that we do try to have some fun while we're here. Chapel Hill in this area is not a bad place to live um, and enjoy. So I think mo uh, many of our fellows do usually enjoy that experience. So there's lots to do. So at this point, 
we're going to go through the question session or go to the question session. So we know we have several questions that we'll, we'll answer um, that are already posted and there may be questions that will come up as well uh, during the next 20 minutes or so. So I'm gonna ask all the fellows who uh, came up here to come up and serve as our panel and answer some of those questions, including myself. So we have collected some of the questions ahead of time, and I think in the interest of time, I'm going to ask some of the most commonly asked questions. Um, one of the questions is that, what are the advantages of the UNC program compared to some other fellowship programs, or how do you think this program differs from other programs? Uh, so at least for the outcomes program, uh, having a chance to take coursework at the College of Public Health here is um, really a tremendous opportunity. It's the number two College of Public Health in the country, and there are few, I don't think there are any other programs that can say you can get that kind of uh, great formal training to go along with industry experience. Uh, the other part of it is I can be at GSK and at UNC uh, during the first and second year, so being able to compare um, how I like industry work versus academic work can really help me decide uh, where I want to end up after this fellowship. Right, from a global regulatory affairs perspective, in terms of advantages for the program, I would say it offers like a lot of flexibility in terms of it is not um, fully regimented if you have an interest in advertising and promotion or in labeling or strategic intelligence or so forth. Um, the program is uh, able to be customized to your interests. And then I think that speaks a lot about, you know, working with the mentors and preceptors that you have both with UNC and, and GSK and the support that they give you throughout the program. Um, another advantage that I would say is, um, like Dr. Dupuy mentioned, the ability to do a uh, FDA rotation. Um, that speaks a lot about the fellowship programs because there are, are not that many fellowships that do offer that um, rotational opportunity. Um, so I'll echo everything that they've already said, uh, but one thing I do uh, really like, as Sarah mentioned, is the flexibility. So even though uh, technically for a medical affairs fellowship, the way it's structured is the first year you're at UNC, mostly work doing clinical research, while the second year you're with the, your partner company uh, doing medical affairs activities. However, it's very flexible. I was heavily involved within my first year, so it's not like just because it's structured that way that you have to be only doing clinical research. So I was pretty involved uh, three months in, not just doing um, clinical research at UNC, but also doing medical affairs related work for GSK. So very flexible and uh, great mentors that are um, extremely flexible as well. And they're very open to what you want, uh, what you want to do and what you want to gain. Um, so, yeah. Um, I will add for the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics uh, fellowships. Uh, I think the biggest advantage is uh, the advanced at graduate level PK courses that you take uh, during the first year. And this really help um, the fellows to um, build strong foundation, develop uh, good knowledge in pharmacokinetics and uh, develop uh, many skills as well uh, that they can utilize uh, throughout their career. Yeah, from a clinical research and drug development perspective, similar to what my co-fellows have said, is having that academic year is really valuable because in the second year, when you get out to the industry setting, you're going to be managing the people who are running your trials. And so having that experience of hands-on, how does it work? How do we get the lab draws? How do we consent the patients? How do we follow them? Um, I think that's really going to help me to better design clinical trials and manage them from an operational side when I get to the company next year. And from the academic fellows standpoint, I think I'll echo what a lot of the other fellows have said and that there is a huge amount of flexibility here at UNC. 
uh, to collaborate if you find an interesting project or a mentor that might be able to help you in a different direction, some coursework that might be able to improve your skills um, that you might not have had before. But also you have all of that flexibility with the support of a program that has been there and done this for quite a long time. There's administrative support. Um, there's the opportunity for funding. Like I mentioned, I applied for a pilot grant this year. So there's a lot of opportunities um, that come with being here at UNC uh, that have been really great so far for me. OK, so the next question. Um, so what advices do you have for current students to better prepare, pre prepare themselves um, to be a competitive applicant? Or along those lines, what skills or experiences would be really valuable to be a successful fellow? I think the most important thing uh, for me looking at fellowships was uh, doing things like this and talking to the actual fellows that were um, currently at the locations that I was looking at. I think. You can read as much as you want online, but until you actually speak to someone that's actively there, um, it's, it's a much better way to get a really good idea of what goes on day to day. And um, for each individual fellowship, there's going to be different skills and things that are um, more valuable. And so speaking to the actual people that are there is probably the most valuable thing. And I know all of us are uh, very welcome to speaking to everyone that has any particular interests. I highly recommend getting involved in research. Any sort of research you can get, whether it's a quality improvement project or maybe just a medication use evaluation project. Um, but getting that research experience as a student, I think, was really helpful. Even if you're looking to go into medical affairs or health outcomes, I think you'll find that valuable. Uh, I don't want to be redundant, but I agree. Try to uh, get involved with uh, in at least one research project during school. Uh, reach out to your um, uh, faculty and professors and explore the research opportunities. Um, this really help you um, build the skills and the knowledge early on and um, make you very competitive um, for any fellowship or even uh, when you start looking for a job. Yeah, and I'll kind of echo what they said as well. Um, so from my perspective, I think it's really important to make the most out of the experiences you have. So as a fourth year fellows, you guys probably go through rotations and you probably had previous rotations as well. Uh, what I learned that was really important is being able to take a step back and kind of reflect on your experiences and um, because when it comes to interviews or uh, job opportunities, you have to be able to reflect on your experiences and articulate them in a way to kind of show people that you, you've learned a lot from your experiences and you didn't just do the bare minimum to pass. So I think that's when, uh, that's why I uh, tell a lot of students to make sure that they're making the most out of the experiences so that uh, when it comes to interviews or uh, when you come face to face with someone, you have something that you can go back and uh, reflect or at least articulate. So, yeah. Okay, excellent answer so far. Um, what I would add to that is don't be afraid to ask a question and become more informed about the fellowship program and what it has to offer. There's a lot of a lot of fellowship programs out there, so I know it can be quite confusing, and um, there's only so many that you can apply to. So what I would say is, again, reach out to current fellows and past fellows. Um, talk to the, the current preceptors and, and mentors throughout the program, and really be informed um, uh, before you get to mid-year. Um, all that was fantastic advice. I'd say something that P4 specifically, if, you, if you're watching that, um, kind of going on what we just said, uh, know your CV inside and out, and um, everyone's going to tell you, you know, research the STAR method for interviewing and, and have a few examples. So get a few examples, but then get a few more, because you'll be very surprised when you're, having in, when you're interviewing um, how quickly you think, oh, I already used my P&T example, now I've got to come up with something else. So really reflect back on everything and, and think of how you can uh, respond to different ways that you showed responsibility or leadership or uh, dealt with a challenge and have multiple examples for each one. I think the only thing I can add to that is that if you have the opportunity to do a rotation, uh, whether it be in, in um, the NIH or the FDA or an in industry, try and do any of those. I mean, those are great experiences. Also try to network with folks. If, say, you don't have the opportunity, find out what goes on in industry. Find some folks that, that you'd be able to talk to about what happens uh, in that setting. So again, and be able to talk with, to um, the interviewers about that because, again, those are things that, that we would be asking and looking for.
And I think some of the fellows already touched on this already. Um, can you guys give some advices for interviewing through PPS? I know a lot of us had gone through that process. No advice. The, um, um, the first question you're almost always going to get is why. Um, either why that program or why this uh, uh, category, why this fellowship, why anything. Um, so really know that inside and out. That really determines how the interview goes. Um, have a genuine answer and, and really show that you've done your research on it as well. Um, to say you really want to get into industry is going to kind of fall flat in a lot of interviews. So know why you want to do this. Thank you. Um, what I would add on to that is it has some idea of like a 30 second pitch, just a little bit about yourself, why you, you are interested in a fellowship program, and essentially what sets you apart from the hundreds of other fellowship applicants that are also interested in a position. Um, so I think that is extremely important. Yeah, I completely agree with what's already been said, but I would also uh, work on like your soft skills, such as uh, being able to communicate what you're saying and also be confident. That's one of the things that most uh, fellow fellowship interviewers are looking for is how confident are you when you answer a question and how well are you able to communicate that answer? Uh, and also just your body language, you know, act like you want to be there. Uh, ask One of the most important things I would say is asking uh, really good question. So if you come prepared and you really want to know about that fellowship, you'll have specific questions for each fellowship uh, that you want to ask. And I think that's where and that's what differentiates a lot of good candidates versus uh, candidates who just ask generic questions. So that's a key thing. Uh, so for the pharmacokinetics fellowships, I would say uh, try to check the the school website before you go to the interviews. Um, check the different research areas of the professors at UNC um, and see which professors do you think you will like to work with um, because you will be asked this during the interviews. This is one thing. The other thing, uh, make sure to be yourself. Uh, prepare, but do not over prepare for the interviews. Um, and yeah, that's it. Uh, in terms of logistical advice, I recommend having about 30 minutes between every one of your interviews. If you're looking at a bunch of diff different programs, your schedule is going to fill up really fast, and you want like that 30-minute break just to collect your thoughts, have a sip of water, and get ready for the next one. I would definitely agree with everything said by all of my other fellows, but also take a deep breath and relax because if you're not relaxed and you're freaking out and you can't think of anything you want to say, you're not going to come across as to all the things about why you want to be there, why you're interested, who you are, what you want to do. Um, and so the most important thing is to find the right fit. You can get into your dream fellowship, but if you were not being yourself and not being realistic about what you want to do, um, it might not be a good fit for your career long term. So you got to take a deep breath and just relax and be yourself. Okay, the next question. So for our fellows, um, what kind of things help you to decide on the current fellowship that you're in or uh, what kind of experiences help you to narrow down your choices? My experience as an academic fellow, um, there are significantly fewer academic fellowships available. So there are really only a few uh, universities that have the support to be able to offer academic fellowships in research. Um, so there was a limited list to start with, but then um, when you look at, like I talked about earlier, uh, there's the flexibility at UNC and all the opportunities, but also that administrative support and having um, this huge fellowship program that has co-fellows and administrative support um, right the way through the whole university um, that's been really helpful and really helped me decide upon UNC. Yeah, I think there are a number of things that drew me to UNC, and one of which is the academic year, because I really felt like that was important. If I was going to be designing clinical trials, I needed to know what it was like on the other side. Another big thing is that United Therapeutics offers both the clinical science and clinical operations, and I felt like it was really important to get experience in my fellowship year in both of those. I will add um, the excellent reputation of the program. Um, the program is very well structured. Uh, um, I really like that you spend the first year, um, as you mentioned, at, at UNC, take advanced courses, and then you apply what you learned during the first uh, year um, and the second year at your sponsor site. 
Um, yeah, so completely agree with what's already been said, but uh, one of the key things at UNC and with, um, with my company, GSK, is that there's a multitude of opportunities, so you'll never fall short of things that you can do. It's really up to the fellows on what they really want to make out of their experience here at the fellowship. So I really like that uh, autonomy that fellows have to make the most out of their uh, fellowship. Okay, and again, I'll, I'll echo with my um, co-fellows as well, but also I will mention that having the ability to gain uh, clinical experience um, also within the regulatory affairs program, I mentioned this earlier, uh, working with the Lineberger Center as well as the Global um, Infectious Disease Center as well, helps you gain a better appreciation and a better understanding of the clinical aspect of things, understanding what is involved in terms of the protocol, um, informed consent, study checklists, um, and all these different components of the clinical aspect that you might not have the opportunity to be involved with um, if you were straight to jump into a full-time position at a job. Um, at least for outcomes, there are very few other opportunities here that give you a chance to work with academic faculty, and that was very important for me to at least have that avenue so I can know, uh, I can decide which area I want to go in after this fellowship. Um, for you all, something that's important and you might not consider right now is, um, you know, also you got to wait until you get to PPS and you have to see and you have to meet people and you have to see who you get along with. Um, you can go into mid-year with your own ranking in your head, but um, until you can meet your potential manager, your potential co-fellows, and see um, how you gel with them, then you know, just keep that in mind that that will change your mind here and there. Obviously, I thought this was definitely a good fit for me. All, all good things. I'm not sure I could add anything to that. Well, maybe I could, but, but for the sake of time, we can go to the next question. So this may be our last question. Um, so what are the benefits of doing a fellowship as compared to getting a position in industry or academia um, straight out of school? Well, I think the challenge there for most people coming out of, uh, particularly out of a pharmacy program with a PharmD is that you may, it may be very difficult to step right into industry. And, and this is certainly a portal into industry. Um, it's a good way to enhance your training and your professionalism, but it's also a good way for the, the companies that we work with, and, and this goes for many other places too, to see what you're all about. And, and you know, once you get your foot in the door, I mean, there are so many opportunities within industry itself. And that's one of the things that I've seen over the years is that a number of our former fellows, they go into industry and they might start off and say regulatory affairs or clinical development, but then they move on to something else or they move on to another company. and so. You know, it's 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 um, very difficult, I think, to do that from right out of school. So I don't know if any of the, the fellows have anything to add to that. So the unfortunate truth is it's a lot more competitive out there than it was five, ten years ago. And some of the people who are talking to you and advising you about these roles maybe had an easier job outlook than, than what it's like today. Um, with that being said, a fellowship is an investment in someone. Um, if you go into industry, uh, I'm sure, you know, you can be a valuable member of a team, but being picked for a fellowship is someone saying, I want to see this person grow and I want to uh, see where we can take this person. And that value that you bring to the company is the equivalent of maybe three or four or five years of work experience that you'd have to gain uh, if you got in without that kind of specific, specific training program. Perfect. Um, also, what I would add to that, within the two-year fellowship program, you have the ability to gain a multitude of experiences in many areas. I know this was already touched upon before, but if you have more than one interest, say, within labeling or um, chemistry manufacturing and control or advertising and promo promotion, there's a lot of flexibility to, to gain those experiences. So that way, at the conclusion of the two-year fellowship, you feel fully confident and um, enables you to obtain a full-time position. Yeah, there's uh, two things. So the first thing is, uh, some of you may not have experience in pharmaceutical industry, so you might think this is what you want, but then once you get there, it might not be what you expected it or the expectations fall short. So a fellowship is a good way to kind of understand what um, the structure is in pharmaceutical industry and what your key role is with, within each department uh, that fall under that medical affairs umbrella. Uh, and another thing is also that 
um, as uh, Dan suggested, it's an investment in you. So whereas if you're, if you're a full-time employee, you're expected to contribute and give value to the company. However, when you're in a fellowship, the, it's a two-way street where the company is also investing in your experience so that they're also looking to make sure that you're getting the most out of your experience and it's just not uh, one way where you're providing the value for the company. I, I agree with all my co-fellows. Uh, I would say that um, the fellowship is two years commitment. It's big investment, uh, but it's definitely worth it uh, because during the, re uh, the, the fellowship, uh, the main focus is you, uh, what skills you need to develop, uh, what gaps in your knowledge you need to fill uh, versus going directly to a job after graduation. Uh, the main focus is actually the job and the projects you're working on, not your skills and your knowledge. When I was trying to decide if I want to do a fellowship or not, I met with a lot of different people at different pharmaceutical companies. And one of the people I met with is a VP at a local pharmaceutical company here. And I asked him, you know, why do the fellowship? And he said, 20 years down the road, if he has two CVs that are identical sitting in front of him, he would hire the person who did the fellowship 20 years ago because it demonstrates that drive and your interest in um, being successful. Again, I think everything said by my co-fellows is really great advice. Um, and also one of the things that um, I thought about a lot in doing a fellowship was that no matter if you did part-time research work and internships throughout pharmacy school, maybe you did every elective rotation you possibly could in industry or research or academia, you're never going to be fully immersed in the environment um, that you would be that you would be gaining from a fellowship. And so that's what I did. I had three years worth of research experience all through pharmacy school. Every single elective rotation I possibly could, I spent at the NIH or at a drug company or doing academia or things like that. Um, and it still pales in comparison to what happens when you're fully immersed in the fellowship program and all of those connections you make and skills you gain by being able to invest in yourself during this time. Last few minutes, um, Dr. Dupuy, can you kind of clarify about the PPS interviewing process? Um, someone was asking whether they would apply to a specific functional area or specific companies. How does that process work? Thank you. Uh, as far as uh, PPS is concerned, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, you would let us know whether you were interested in medical affairs or regulatory affairs or drug development or academic fellowship, and depending on what, your in what area you're interested in, um, then we would decide who are you going to interview with. So, so if it was medical affairs, you would interview with um, um, GSK or United Therapeutics because those are the two that we offer medical affairs with. You'd also interview with UNC faculty as well. So you really would have at least three interviews while you're there for that. If it's regulatory affairs, it's only going to be with GSK. If it's clinical drug development, it would be with United Therapeutics and, and um, um, PPD, for instance. And if it was PK, it would be with Quintiles and, and Nuventra, as well as UNC faculty. So, so again, depending on what area you're interested in, um, that would determine how many interviews we set up with you. So it could be two interviews or it could be three interviews and such. So hopefully that helps. All right. I think that concludes our webinar for tonight. Um, if you have further questions, feel free to reach out to all the fellows here or our director here. All our contact information can be found on our website. Um, also, the recording of the webinar, uh, this webinar as well as Tuesday webinar um, will be posted on our website as well. Um, so next up is our graduate program, PhD program webinar. Uh, if you're interested, feel free to stay online. And thanks, everybody. <laughs>